in the Acts of the Apostles, reading together from chapter 1 and verse 15, uh, the Word of God, uh, the early church and its uh, choice of uh, Matthias to replace uh, Judas, so that the, the number 12 could remain intact. The Acts of the Apostles, the first chapter and the 15th verse, in those days Peter stood up among the brethren. The company of persons was in all about a hundred and twenty, and said, Brethren, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David, concerning Judas, who was guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us, and was allotted his share in this ministry. In verse 20, For it is written in the book of Psalms, Let his habitation become desolate, and let there be no one to live in it. And also in another psalm, Let, his, let another take his office, his bishopric, his office let another take. And so one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection, because that's what made an apostle, someone who had seen the risen Lord. And they put forward two names, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justus, and Matthias. <clears throat> and they prayed and said, Lord, who knowest the hearts of all men, show which one of these two thou hast chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was enrolled with the eleven apostles. Amen. And the Lord will bless the reading of his word to us. The second half of Acts chapter 1 records the story of the choosing of Matthias as the twelfth apostle. It seems that the early disciples were anxious about the number 12, uh, perhaps because of the spiritual associations of 12 uh, in the Old Testament. Jacob had 12 sons, there were 12 tribes in Israel, and Jesus had chosen 12 men. And 12 was simply 3, which is the sacred number, multiplied by 4, which is the earthly number. Four corners of the earth, the four winds of heaven, the four points of the compass, and so on. 4 is the number of this world, and 3 is the sacred number. And so 12 was uh, the divine multiplied by the earthly, and that's the symbolism of the number. And now that Judas had gone, they were now eleven. And so they prayed, and they cast lots, and they chose Matthias. In fact, that was a typically pre-Pentecostal way of discovering the will of God. And it was one of the standard ways of finding out what God wanted men to do. There are lots of references in the Old Testament to the casting of lots and the drawing of lots to find out the will of God. And in fact, there were two special stones in the Old Testament called the Urim and the Thummim, which means lights and perfections, and the priests used to handle these two stones in some way that we do not understand, and he used the two stones, the Urim and the Thummim, to find out 
what the will of God was to be. Now, of course, all the heathen nations round about Israel eh, discovered the will of the gods by other means, by luck or by good fortune. You consulted the wizards and the fortune tellers and the magicians if you wanted to find out what the gods wanted you to do. You went to the augurers who would kill a bird and then tell by the state of the liver or the entrails whether you were going to have good luck or not, whether the gods wanted you to go and fight or stay at home or get married or whatever. And uh, you still have people today who believe in luck. They say, Oh, it's the luck of the draw. Your marriage, <clears throat> it's just luck, you know. Or the way your children grow up, <clears throat> or your job, or your health, it's just the luck of the draw. I'm sure that now the vast majority of people believe that the goddess Fortuna is on the throne of the universe. It's all a matter of chance. What happens to you? It's all a matter of good luck or bad luck. And that's why they resort to football pools and bingo and horse racing and dog racing and raffles and tombola and other speculative ventures. Oh, I had a lucky night at the bingo. I won the raffle. My luck came up. You hear them saying, I had a lucky draw. Fortuna Regina. Long live chance on the throne of the universe. Well, in Israel, it was very different. The whole matter was committed to the Lord in prayer. Of course, there was a casting of lots. But the lots were cast by men specially chosen and set apart by God, by men who were in touch with the true and the living God who sits on the throne of the universe and disposes all things according to the counsels of his own will. And that Old Testament idea of praying and casting lots seems to have been kept up by the disciples until the day of Pentecost. After the day of Pentecost, when the Spirit of God had been given to the church, you never again read of Christians casting lots to find out the will of God. Now that the Spirit of God has come, there are other ways of finding out God's will and guidance for a Christian is given in other ways. Now, I don't want to say much this morning about the actual choice of Matthias here. My own feeling is that Matthias was the wrong man. Uh, this, this episode is a typical byproduct of uh, Peter's impetuous mentality. Peter was an activist, you know. He was always barging in. He's the sort of man who acts first and thinks later. And that's a very dangerous way to run your life. To act first and then think later. And he really is typical of the many Christians you get around the churches whose attitude to the Lord's work is this. Now let's just say a, a quick prayer and again get on with our own thing. Certainly, you never hear of this man, Matthias, again. And the rest of the New Testament suggests that it was Paul who was the twelfth apostle. Because Paul says over and over again, Am not I an apostle? 
Have not I seen the Lord? Well, I don't really want to deal with that mistake of choosing Matthias. What I want to speak about this morning is guidance. How do you discover the will of God for your life? Or for any particular situation? And of course this is of immense practical importance for every Christian because uh, discerning the will of God is something that touches every aspect of your life. Marriage is a vocation. Should you marry? Singleness is a vocation. Should you stay single? What should your choice of career be? That's especially difficult if you're a good all-rounder and if there are several things you could do quite well. How do you know which career God wants you in? Should you change your job? Should you sell your house? Should you adopt a child? A Christian should always approach these problems of discerning God's will and getting guidance from God in a positive and a hopeful standpoint. Because a Christian stands on three rocks. The first rock is this. God wants to guide you and to lead you. He has no desire at all that you should be living in obscurity or ignorance of what he wants you to be and what he wants you to do. God wants to guide and lead you. The second rock is this. God wants you to know what his will is. He doesn't delight to hide his will from his children. Now, of course, sometimes God does veil his face. Sometimes he does go behind the clouds for a wee while. For special purposes. But the norm is that God wants you to know what his will is. And the third rock is, having known what his will is, God wants you to do his will. Uh, because uh, knowing the will of God is not a theoretical exercise. It's not philosophy. It's not speculation. It's not an academic head thing, knowing the will of God. God wants you to do his will. Let me read you one or two verses from the scriptures where men long for the guidance of God. And if you are a Christian this morning, I'm sure you'll find bells ringing and echoes sounding inside you as I read these verses. From Psalm 5 verse 8. Lead me, O Lord. Lead me in thy righteousness and make thy way straight before me. From Psalm 25 and verse 5. O Lord, lead me in thy truth, for thee I wait all the day long. Psalm 48 and verse 14. Tell the next generation, this is our God, and he will be our guide forever and ever. Psalm 73 with which we opened our worship. Thou dost guide me with thy counsel, and afterwards thou wilt receive me to glory. From Isaiah 42, God says, I will lead the blind in a way that they know not, in paths that they have not known, I will guide them. I will turn their darkness before them into light. I will make the rough places into level ground. These are the things that I will do 
and I will not forsake them. And spilling over into the New Testament, Paul says in Romans 12, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. What adjectives? It's a good will, it's an acceptable will, and it is a perfect will. Ephesians 5, Paul says, Make the most of the time, for the days are evil, and do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Now all of that sounds very religious and churchy and pious, doesn't it? But it all has to do with the down-to-earth practicalities of Christian living. How do you find guidance from God? Should you buy yourself a new winter coat? Or should you make do with the old one? Is this the right time to be selling your house and buying another? Should you now consider applying for another position? Ought you to be thinking about studying for the ministry? Is your right place as a Christian not here at home at all, but somewhere on the mission field serving Christ? Does God want you to marry or to stay single? Is the time right for you to move on? How do you find out God's will for your life? Let me put it like this. When you want to know what God wants you to do, you ask yourself five questions. The first question is this. Is there a sure word from the Lord? Has God given you a certain promise from the book? Is there a, is there a verse ringing in your head and you just can't get it out of your system? It can be a dangerous thing, of course, relying on that alone. A sure word from the Lord because um, we can go to the Bible and find out verses that suit ourselves. We can go to the Bible and find verses that will justify all sorts of escapades that Christians get up to. I'm sure you've heard of Billy Graham telling the story of the man who wanted guidance. So he opened his Bible and stuck a pin in. And it was the verse, Judas went and hanged himself. And so he thought, well, that wasn't very promising. So he opened the Bible again and stuck in a pin. And the verse was, go thou and do likewise. Well, you see, that question, is there a sure word from God on its own? is not an infallible guide to what God wants you to do. So you ask a second question. Is the Spirit of God prompting you? Is there an inner irresistible conviction? Is there a push inside you, a little pressure inside you, telling you that that's the right thing for you to do? Now, of course, this too by itself can be dangerous because the New Testament tells us that uh, the Holy Spirit is not the only spirit that is working in the world. There are all sorts of spirits. Not all the spirits want you to do the will of God. Try the spirits, said John, to see whether they be from God. 
And so when a Christian comes to me and says, I've been led by the Spirit to... And there's nothing else to substantiate it. Then I am suspicious. On its own, it's dangerous. It's like the sure word from the Lord. On its own, it's dangerous. I heard um, some years ago of two Christian girls who were quite sure the Holy Spirit was calling them to go to Indonesia. And time after time, their work permits were refused, and their visas were refused, and all the doors were closed. That went on for a number of years. And Christian friends, of course, kept sending them money to keep them alive and encourage them. And imagine the dismay of the Christian friends when they were suddenly told that the Holy Spirit was not now leading the girls to go to Indonesia. Surely there's something wrong with that kind of guidance. The voice of the Spirit itself is not enough. So you ask yourself a third question. <clears throat> Are the circumstances right? Are they propitious? Are the doors opening? Are the windows opening? Is the mist clearing? Are the circumstances right? And once again, on its own, that can be very dangerous as a rule for guidance. I'll give you some examples. Brazil and the Argentine are very needy countries spiritually. They are steeped in many areas in virtual paganism with a veneer of Roman Catholicism voodoo, black magic, all the ancient gods with a lick of Christianity. That doesn't mean you should rush out <coughs> to Brazil and Argentine to evangelize. Would the circumstances be propitious right now? Denmark is a very needy land from a Christian point of view. It is, of course, the citadel of European pornography. It's the country that manufactures the lewd books that your children will be looking at one day. They are already circulating around the schools. But the Danish government is now discouraging Christians, Christian workers, from entering the country. The Greater European Mission reported in its recent magazine that several Christian workers from the Church of the Nazarene and from Campus Crusade for Christ have been denied visas and work permits for Denmark. It may well be that the almighty Lutheran Church, which is the state church in Denmark, is jealous of its power. Or it may well be, as I suspect, that the pornography merchants control essential areas of influence. Denmark is a needy country. But that doesn't mean we should all rush off to evangelize Denmark. Right circumstances by themselves are not sure guidance. So you ask a fourth question. Have you got the equipment for what you think the Lord is calling you to? Have you got what it takes? It's an old saying in Christian circles, and I think it still holds true that God's callings are his enablings. That's to say, when he summons you to do something, he doesn't send you empty. He gives you what you need. Some of you have heard of Willie and Katie Black, 
who left their ministry in Kinloch Bervy recently and went to Korea to work with the Overseas Missionary Fellowship. It's a well-known fact that Willie Black has always hated language study and he was always worst at languages. And yet the recent news is that he's actually enjoying the study of Korean, which is a hard oriental language. God's calling is his enabling. Have you got the equipment? And yet that in itself is not sure guidance. I think you know that I enjoy doing languages, best of all, French and Latin, Greek, Hebrew, Czech, Russian, Spanish, Italian. I love them. That doesn't mean I should rush off to evangelize the world. So you ask question number five. Have you made allowance for the Holy Spirit's originality? He loves to do a new thing. He loves to break the bounds and be devastatingly fresh and vivacious and new. Behold, I do a new thing in the earth. Of course, he doesn't break the laws of God. And he doesn't go beyond scripture. He doesn't deny scripture. But he loves to do something new. Have you made allowance for that in your life? Take these five. Each one by itself is not enough. But when the five converge, it's a rather sure sign that God is saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. Have you a sure word from God? <clears throat> is the Spirit prompting you? Are the circumstances right? Have you got what it takes? Are you allowing the Spirit his privilege to do a new thing? When they coalesce, when they merge, when they fuse, this is the way. Walk ye in it. Let me give a word of personal testimony in closing. How did I know <clears throat> 11 years ago that it was right for me to come here there was nothing wrong with Holy Town. I was perfectly happy. I loved the people. There was fruit. Lives had been changed. People had been converted to Christ. And three men had gone into the ministry from a tiny congregation. I was in Holy Town for nine years. And during the last three years, I noticed two things happening. First of all, although there was blessing in the church, the real blessing always seemed to happen elsewhere. When I preached outside the parish, the real response to what I was saying was when I was at other gatherings, conventions, speaking to students in the Christian unions, in the universities, that's where the blessing was and that's where the real appreciation was. And it was as if God was saying to me, this era is ending. I think that is a pretty sure sign, you know, in a minister's life when the real blessing happens outside the church. I'll know when to move from here when the real blessing stops here and happens somewhere else. The second thing I noticed was, <clears throat> of course, the number of vacancy committees nosing around. There were, in fact, 13 
nine of them weren't interested in me, and four made me sole nominee. The first of these was a mining community like Holy Town, and I didn't want to go from one mining community into another mining community. The second was South Carntine Church in Glasgow, and the third was St. George's Church, Dumfries. Very attractive. They wanted a man who would preach the gospel. There was a lovely three manual organ, you see, and a smashing choir, and a long, fine musical tradition. And the voice said, No, 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 no. The lines weren't converging. And then a note came from John McEwan. And God said, this is it. You see, it was God who brought me here. If you're fighting against my ministry, I think some of you are, you're fighting against the God who brought me here. It was God who brought me here, and only God will take me away. You do understand that, don't you? Wasn't the bonny town, oh, it is a bonny town, wasn't the lovely people, and you are lovely people, wasn't the salary, wasn't the bonny manse? So I'm grateful for all of these things. It was God. Sometimes, it can be very frustrating discovering what God wants you to do. But stand on the three rocks, my friend. He wants to guide and lead you. He wants you to know what he wants you to do. And he wants you to do what he wants. And he does it by a sure word by the Spirit's prompting, by arranging the circumstances, by giving you the equipment, what it takes, and sometimes by asking you to allow the Holy Spirit to do a new thing in your life. Now, how ready are you to expose yourself all of that. Amen. May the Lord add a blessing to his word, to his name be honor and praise.